So you want to build a schoolie. Awesome. There are a number of reasons why this lifestyle makes sense outside of the influencer travel everywhere thing, especially in this economy. But after spending the past two years researching how to build buses properly, building my own bus and living in it for a year, I think most people are doing it wrong. And this video is my attempt to explain how to do it right, in my opinion, for the least amount of money, what is valuable and where most people go wrong. Let's get into it. So why a school bus? There's a number of reasons this platform makes sense, but here's why I think a school bus is an awesome platform. For the price, it is the most space you can get on wheels and the most solid platform you can get on wheels. School buses are kind of going between five and $10,000 now. For that, you get something that is double or more the size of any Sprinter van and a commercial chassis that's very, very solid to build on. Also, if you're like me, you think rent is stupid. You're throwing away money every month and in honestly a little over a year of just saving rent you could have built your own house that you own so as people my age it's a very viable track to housing that is really cool and serves all of your needs and doesn't really cost you anything in terms of rent and you own so basically the big reason to choose a school bus in particular is your trading drivability, adaptive cruise control, and you know, a van for a wholly better platform to build on, a ton more space, and a super low cost of entry for that platform. It's up to you to decide whether this may or may not be right for you, but that is why I chose a school bus. School buses also have to be able to roll over in the event of a crash. So a school bus in particular is a very solid platform to build on physically. Most of the things I'm gonna cover in this in terms of build philosophy apply to building any kind of home-built camper, whether you're converting a cargo trailer, whether you're converting a van, whether you're upgrading a camper, most of this will apply, but this is specifically for the conversion of a school bus. So before you jump into this, I wanna preface this with what you need to expect, what skill set you need to do this. I don't think this is that hard to do. I have a background in building stuff. I just grew up using tools for toys and just built stuff in the shed. If you have zero mechanical inclination and zero experience building anything, this is going to be a journey, but it's not, not doable. To do it right, you should budget about $20,000 to $30,000. You can do it for less. You can definitely do it for more, but I think twenty dollars to $30,000 is a very reasonable price range for doing something that is very, very serviceable and very nice. Okay, so let's acquire a bus. What are we looking for? in the platform. The biggest debate I see most often is, do I want a short bus? Do I want a full-size bus? Or do I want a bus like mine that's kind of a full-size bus, but not quite as long? And then do I want a flat nose or do I want a hood, a dog nose bus? You can acquire all these for about the same price. So this is more up to a, what do you want the vehicle to do? Let's start with short buses, drawbacks and upside. The biggest benefit is it's going to be small and easy to maneuver. The down Downside, in my opinion, is the size. It's not much bigger than a van. However, it is wider. You're working on a basically van chassis or half ton truck chassis, which limits your total weight, depending on if it's a dually or a single axle, especially. So you'll have to be conscious about how much your bus weighs. You also are more into the consumer side of vehicles, whereas school buses, full size ones are commercial vehicles. They're, they're heavy duty. The engines may be similar, but just the overall thickness and construction of the chassis itself is going to be thinner metal compared to a full-size school bus, which is going to have frame rails like a semi-truck. Full-size school buses. A lot of my initial information on schoolies came from going to Tiny Fest in San Diego in 2023. I talked to people who had short buses, full-size buses, and mid-size buses. The people with the short buses consistently told me that, yeah, it's a little too small, especially for two people full-time. The people with the 
full-size buses consistently told me it's a lot of room kind of a bear to maneuver the people with the mid-size full-size buses said i really love the amount of space i have if you have two or more people and plan to go full-time i think looking at a full-size bus is a great option it gives you the option to put a wall up in the middle and make two separate rooms just more living space to not be on top of each other all the time you have a lot of space to work with so if you're looking for maybe a toy hauler in the back or just storage or an extra couch that's the way to go the mid-size bus i have i personally love this size because you get all of the benefits of having a full-size commercial chassis and big engine but it fits in two parking spaces Spaces. The wheelbase of this particular bus and most buses this size are quite short. So the turning radius is really good. And in a lot of places I can fit in a single parking spot if I have room to stick the butt of the bus over. And then finally, the, the flat nose versus dog nose configuration. In retrospect, I think going flat nose is a great idea. Basically you get four more feet of usable space inside the bus for the same bumper to bumper length. I thought the downside would be working on it and not having Having engine accessibility but turns out the engine accessibility on those is great the only downside I really see to them is the weight distribution between the axles with a flat nose bus you're gonna have a significantly more weight on the front axle and if you're driving in a soft sandy surface that's gonna sink in first and the other drawback is your approach angle over an obstacle is pretty low with a flat nose bus especially if that front axle is really far back now listen up this is important and engines and transmissions on your bus are gonna play a huge role in how the whole thing performs. The engines that are the best, International DT466E is the gold standard. It is a sleeved engine, which means you can rebuild it in frame. You don't have to pull the whole engine out. Known to be very reliable straight six engine. It's basically a mini semi truck engine. That's the best one if you can find a DT466. Other engines that are really good, I have a Cat C7, great engine. The International Navistar 7.3 diesel, it's a V8. It's basically a Ford 7.3, great engine, super reliable. Cummins engines are quite good. The 5.9 in smaller buses is gonna be great and get really good mileage, somewhere around 10, although it is a little bit underpowered. The Cummins 8.3, you're gonna find in bigger buses, great engine, good power. I would honestly avoid anything Mercedes, when it comes to short buses, you're looking for the Ford 7.3, you're looking for a Duramax, that's a Chevy engine. If you get that, heck, you could tune it to hell and do burnouts. I would avoid the Ford 6.0 Power Stroke. That one's known to be not so reliable, the 6.0 no. If you can find something really new with 6.7 Power Stroke, awesome. And then transmissions. Buses are built to do a lot of different things. Most medium-sized buses like mine are not designed for the highway. They're designed for short, tight routes. And a lot of them ended up with the Allison AT545 transmission. Do not get this transmission. It is a four speed without an overdrive. So you're gonna top out at 45 or 50 miles an hour on the highway. But the biggest problem with it is it does not have a locking torque converter. If you don't know what that means, basically speaking, there is never a connection between the wheels of the bus and the engine. So all of the power from the engine is getting pushed through a transmission fluid through the torque converter, which heats up on big hills. But the biggest problem with this transmission is when you go down a steep grade, there's no connection between the wheels and the engine so you get zero engine braking at all which is honestly pretty dangerous you'd be completely relying on the braking system of your bus to slow you down and on a big mountain grade that can get pretty spicy even with a transmission that locks up in this bus some of these grades can get pretty exciting the allison pts people transport system i believe 2500 3000 3500 great transmissions if you can find a six speed even better basically just anything besides the at545 and then finally, when you go buy a bus, we're looking for something under 250,000 miles, ideally no rust, very little. When you search for the bus, do not be opposed to searching the entire country and being willing to go fly somewhere and go pick something up for a much better platform. Avoid stuff from the rust belt. I would look in places like Southern California, Arizona, New Mexico, Las Vegas, places where it's dry and they don't salt the roads and it doesn't snow 
know. So you're getting a platform that at the very least is not rusted and things are moldy and rotten inside. This is one of the places where you're gonna wanna spend a little bit of extra money to get the nicest thing you possibly can. Okay, so you have a bus. Now it is time to turn it into a home. Before we do that, there's some prerequisites I wanna talk about on how to make that process as smooth and as straightforward as possible. Things to avoid. Honestly, I would try to avoid at all costs trying to live out of the bus while building it. You really are just gonna turn it into a construction zone and go. Even if you have to post up at your parents' house to do this, that's better than trying to live out of it. It's gonna be a mess while you build it. If you can find a place indoors, a shop, that is ideal deal. Staying out of the elements is wonderful. Having a place to store lumber and all the other things you're just going to have laying around and not being in the grass or in a parking lot is going to be fantastic. You're going to need tools. <laughs> Impact screw gun, circular saw, chop saw, an oscillating multi-tool with a scraper blade takes all of the reflective stickers off the outside of the bus, which is hard to take off otherwise. Pull saw, great tool. Shark bite tool and using PEX piping, great. A drill, drill bits and then wood to metal self-tapping screws those you want those the time you put into this is going to depend on you i chose to do this kind of as a fast burn all at once it was like 52 days of full-on work i wouldn't recommend that so much but i think for some things like tearing out the inside putting in the flooring putting in the ceiling the stuff that takes a lot of time it's really good to just get in the zone of i am building and go all right now this is where I think the biggest things go wrong when people try to build buses and they cut corners. Let's talk about the priorities of your bus. Now, it depends on what you're doing, but I think even if you're just using it for weekends, building something that's gonna be comfortable and have a shower and place to use the bathroom is way better than cutting those corners now and then having to deal with them the entire time you have to build. Biggest priorities. Insulation. Hands down, if the only thing you do is just build a well-insulated box, you are on a good path. And tearing out the whole inside, the floor, the ceiling, the walls, gutting it and starting from scratch is where most people go wrong because it's intimidating. You have to get everything out and start fresh. Power system, in my opinion, if you spend most of your money on one thing besides insulation, make it your power system. Most people are woefully underpowered in my opinion. Having power to do things like run an air conditioner and still charge your batteries, not worry about leaving lights on, not worrying about switching an inverter on and off, not worrying about charging your phone. This is where you wanna be. I'll dive more into this a little bit later. How much water do you want on board? Do you wanna shower? You do, I promise you do. Are you gonna do a roof raise? That would be something that I would say, hey, go do your own research. If you're getting into a roof raise, then you, you're you beyond this video in my opinion. And then, then what do you want the layout to do and how do you want it to all work? Another thing to consider with the bus you're getting is what brand it is and the internal height of it. I'm 5'8", and I have just a standard bus, no roof raise, and I don't touch the ceiling, but a lot of people who are about six feet tall come in my bus and they don't reach the ceiling. In that case, you might be looking into a roof raise, but you might be able to get away with a Thomas bus or a taller bus. There's some random models of buses that are taller inside. In general, if you look at Thomas brand buses, their roof is raised. If you're slightly taller, that might be a really good option to avoid doing the whole roof raise thing and avoid bumping your head on the ceiling all the time. Okay, let's start doing stuff and laying the groundwork for our bus build. In my opinion, the first thing you should do is paint your bus. The paint you put on your bus, the way it presents from the outside is going to have a huge impact on how people perceive you. Now that is up to you, how you'd like to be perceived. You can either look pretty dirty and a mess and not something people want around, or if you put a little extra time into your appearance from the outside, you can be something that people are excited to see and find novel. And I also 
think by painting your bus first, it is this grand step forward towards this is mine and it looks really cool and I want the inside to be as cool as the outside and it just gets you stoked on the process to look at this painted thing and go, wow, I'm gonna build the inside of that. Awesome. I painted my bus with a roller and a paintbrush and tractor paint. The bottom is Ford Blue, the top is International Harvester White. Honestly, I wouldn't recommend using a roller. I would totally spray your bus. When it comes to painting, 90% of painting is in the prep work. Wash the bus completely and then sand the bus completely. Anything that is shiny, paint is going to eventually chip off of. Sander, scotch bright, sandpaper, anything you can use to scuff up the entire surface of the bus and get any loose foreign objects or chipping paint off of the thing, the better. After you sand the bus and wash it twice with Dawn dish soap, a soap that doesn't have wax in it, use a paint prep liquid. There's ones that aren't super toxic and caustic that remove all of the grease and any little things from the bus. This is a recommendation from my friend Josh McGee. I wiped everything down on this bus before I painted it with this stuff and the paint has stuck fantastically. Pick your colors, don't use rattle cans. You want an airless sprayer or an air gun and prime it first, use a heavy duty primer. You want the nastiest, toughest paint you can possibly get. Paint it whatever colors you want. Make sure you spend a lot of time masking and, and making sure that no overspray is gonna get on a window or a tire. Really, really put the time into this because it's, a, it's kind of a one and done deal. You want this to look as nice as possible. So now you're in the valley of despair, friends. You are looking at your bus and it's time to start building. Here's a few tips for just getting a baseline in. Tip number one, everything's going to go back to insulation. Go to Home Depot, pick up some sill tape. It's this thin foam stuff. Anytime there's a piece of wood that touches metal of the bus anywhere, you're going to put this sill tape in between that wood. This is going to prevent a lot of heat transfer from the metal of the bus through the wood into your living space. Doing this consistently over the course of the entire bus will make a big impact on heat transfer from the metal to your living space. Bare bones, first, first step, put a subfloor in. There's gonna be a bunch of holes from the seats. Use aluminum flashing and some roofing caulk and just cover all those holes. Make sure everything's sealed. The subfloor is basically your floor under your floor. You wanna insulate with something in the floor. I chose inch and a half poly iso board, which is great because it lines up perfectly with the width of a two by four. I would perimeter the entire bus with two by four so you have something to screw to near the wall and then put poly iso board in the entire middle of it. Use liquid nails to stick that to the floor so it never squeaks. Use wood to metal self-tapping screws to put the two by fours on the floor. On top of your two by four perimeter and poly iso board center of insulation, take quarter inch plywood or three eighths inch plywood and just plate the whole thing down with plywood. And now you have a clean floor on which you can build and which you can screw things to in the future. The plywood is gonna give you something to screw to. Now you have have a floor and this is your starting point to build. Before I talk about insulation, I want to talk about the wall. Now, the wall is something my friend Dennis introduced me to and it is basically the concept of behind the first window of the bus building a wall uh, that is insulated to separate your living space from the driving space. There's a number of benefits to this. I would probably not do this in a short bus, but in any other size bus, this is the way. Insulating the whole back of the bus not that hard. Insulating the firewall, the windshield, everything in the front of the bus, pretty hard. Also, I like my space to feel like a house and not like I'm living in a vehicle and closing that door and shutting it is a lot of privacy and makes it feel like a home inside. It also gives you a lot of wall space to hang things up and just makes the whole thing feel a lot more complete. Okay, it's insulation time and this is the biggest single pitfall that most people run into when they build their bus on their own. Not insulating enough. Let's look at this from a bigger perspective. You are trying to take a metal tin can and go sit out in the middle of the sun and try to stay somewhat comfortable. If you don't have any insulation, that thing is gonna heat up like a greenhouse and get so hot so fast. However, if you insulate this box, you are going to have a space that is hard for the heat of the sun to heat up inside and hard for the energy or cooling you've put into it to escape. It's going to make your heater work better and your air conditioner work better and overall you have a much more comfortable experience.
Yes. We have unmuted in CB. Oh my God. Wes, I'm filming a video about how to build a bus right now. Oh yeah, you need a CB radio. Do you have any advice? Uh, find a friend with a shop with a bunch of tools. That's you. <laughs> find a Wes. And have some sort of welding skills. Now I chose to use rock wool insulation for this. A lot of people do spray foam. Some pros and cons to spray foam. It's pretty permanent. You need to have everything that's in the spray foam in the spray foam before you spray it. It could not set up right and you could have a gooey mess on your hands. But rock wool seemed to work really good for me. But basically now the name of the game is any void we can fill with insulation with rock wool or spray foam. We're going to fill. So the slot on the wall that the stock insulation came in from, we're gonna fill that. The wall in the front, we're gonna fill that. In my wall, there's two layers. This is where I think a lot of people also go wrong. In my opinion, you should not build to the window. You should build off the window uh, about the width of a two by four. This will allow you to frame out your windows and put insulation in between them and it will just make the whole thing feel a lot more complete. But the main thing is keeping a ton of exposed metal away from the inside of your bus covered in insulation and giving you double the insulation in the wall that's going to get broadsided with the heat. It also gives you a place to store things on the shelves. You're gonna do this by running a piece of wood across the top and across the bottom and they should match up in thickness and you should just be able to frame the whole windows with all corresponding wood to make this wall come out. This also gives us a secondary inside place to run all of our wires and all of our plumbing that is insulated but before you do that, before you build your own wall and your second layer of insulation, you need to run all of your plumbing and wiring. Now this is the place I think I messed up the most with this bus. I really wish I had more outlets in the back of the bus. At this point, you kind of need to make a decision on where you want your outlets and the layout of your bus, which is gonna completely be up to you and how much 12 volt power you want. If you build a solar system around an air conditioner, having 12 volt power to reduce power consumption is really not that big of a deal. Running anything besides an air conditioner for this solar system is an absolute joke. So I just, you know, use wall warts. But at any rate, you cannot put wiring in the wall after the wall's up. So you're gonna need to run wires down the bottom of the wall and go okay this is where I want this wire to be this is where I want this pipe to be this is where the sinks gonna be this is gonna be the shower uh, before you put that wall up and just make note of it on the outside so when you go to cut in and find that in the future it's right there for you I honestly just use regular Romex for a house and then I think I used underground wiring for the 12 volt which is just a, a two conductor stuck together wire that was very easy to work with and pretty cheap. This is one of those things where it's baked in and you can't add to it in the future. So even if you have too much in places in my bus, there's wire in the wall that I never used. That's fine, but make sure you put in wiring for every outlet you want and run a wire to that and run it up to the front or wherever you're going to house your batteries. I think by doing the wall, it gives you this wonderful spot to put your batteries and your inverter and your solar controller up out of your living space. When it comes to the plumbing, use shark bite stuff. Another thing I regret doing is not installing plumbing for an internal water tank under the bed. I would recommend doing external water tanks that are huge. I have two 55 gallon drums under here. I have a hundred gallons of usable water. But the problem is in the winter, they can and have frozen and then you have no water. You could put a 50 gallon tank inside under your bed and have plumbing to that and never use it unless it's really cold. But having that option is fantastic. I think it's a great idea. My goal of this video really isn't to talk about layout. That's completely up to you. It's more about philosophies of building a bus that are gonna set you up for success in the long term. So a lot of this is up to your creativity of where you wanna place things, where you want outlets, your specific layout, where you want your bathroom shower, that kind of stuff. Once you got all your wiring in, I would seal up your walls with plywood or whatever you wanna finish your walls with. And now it's time to talk about electrical, which is the second and I think place people skimp out on the most because of a lack of information. Let's talk about how to do solar on a bus right. To the youngsters, I know you're having fun. I used to have fun myself, but there's something you need to know. Stuff like that? That's a load of crap. 
That's a load of crap. Okay, let's get some terminology out of the way. You're gonna hear watts, amp hours, kilowatt hours, volts, when we talk about power. If you don't know anything, I want you to ignore amp hours and just for a second think about everything in watts and watt hours or kilowatt hours. Solar output and battery capacity can be thought about in watts and kilowatt hours. For this video, let's just say a thousand watts is how much power a toaster uses, which is a lot of power. And let's call a kilowatt hour, which is 1000 watts sustained for an hour, one toaster hour. One kilowatt hour will run a toaster for an hour. Most people go, well, I don't really need that much power. I just want to charge my laptop. You want an air conditioner. Oh, it's the best. And to run a mini split air conditioner, you need at least a thousand watts of solar. And that sounds like a lot, but in this day and age, it's not that much. Go on Facebook Marketplace and just search solar panels. Try to find some panels that came from a project that were surplus and somebody's trying to get rid of. That's what mine are. They're 360 watt bifacial panels and then you want a good bit of battery. In my opinion, five kilowatt hours is a, is a great, this will get you by, more is always better. In the initial phase, if you're gonna throw money at something, I would throw it at the solar panels because that's gonna be a lot of install and permanent mountings that aren't going to be super friendly to update in the future. So get the best panels you can, fit as many as you possibly can on the roof. Don't build a deck. It's cool for pictures and hanging out some Sometimes, but I look at it like, okay, you have a deck on your bus and you use it maybe a couple times a week and watch the sunset on it, but then now it's winter and your fridge isn't running, or now it's summer and you don't have power to run an air conditioner because you skimped on the solar so you could have a deck and you're not on your roof because it's 20 degrees or you're not on your roof because it's 120 degrees. The batteries are really easy to upgrade as long as you have space to put another one in. It is two wires, it genuinely could take less than half an hour to put another battery in and double your, your storage capacity. Huge solar, as much as you could possibly fit and as much batteries as you can afford. And then to run all of this, you're gonna need a solar controller and an inverter. Uh, the solar controller, the MPPT, is basically taking all of the energy that the solar panels makes, which varies wildly in voltage and amperage and just deals with it and charges your battery. The inverter is going to take the battery voltage, which is 12, 24, or 48 volts, and turn that into 120 volt house power, which is, you know, what this lamp is using. They make solar controller inverter in one combo units, which are very useful, save a lot of wiring and space. Basically, plug your solar into it, plug your battery into it, and it's gonna spit out 120 volt power and charge your batteries. There's a lot of tutorials online on how to do this. I'm not gonna get into that, but those are my recommendations. I would also consider strongly not doing a 12 volt system. So you can choose like, are my batteries gonna be 12 volt, 24, 36, or 48 volts? The benefits of doing a higher voltage system are that it's more efficient. The inverter does not have to take such a low voltage and push it up to such a higher voltage. You can also run thinner battery leads, which are cheaper. The only downside is then if you want to run 12 volt wiring for USB outlets, you're gonna to need to get a step down transformer. They're very cheap, but it's just one more thing you have to wire. And then on the note of power, we're talking about making all of this power and storing all of this power. In my opinion, the goal of it is to run an air conditioner, which is a high draw item. Not all air conditioners are created equal. The air conditioner to get for any kind of mobile, really anything, is an inverter-based mini split. One, they're just overall significantly more efficient than a window rattler or one of those ceiling units that campers use, which usually pull 1500 watts. An inverter-based mini split will ramp its power demand and its compressor speed based on demand. So when you're cooling your bus off to start with and it's really hot, it's gonna be at full power. Mine pulls 800 watts at full power, but once the bus cools down and if you have really good insulation and the bus is able to maintain that temperature it's going to ramp its compressor down and be pulling maybe three four or five hundred watts of power and still keep your bus cool this is magical especially if you have a thousand or fifteen hundred watts of solar it means you can cool your bus run your air conditioner at will 
and still be charging your batteries. There's a lot of tutorials online on how to install a mini split air conditioner. I did it myself. It was really not that hard. If you don't want to do it or you don't know how to do it at all and you're scared, you can hire an HVAC person to come do it and it's probably pretty cheap for the install. But if there's one piece of advice you get from this video, it's that most people are not insulating their buses correctly or really at all and end up with something that even if they had the power and air conditioner to try to cool it, wouldn't stay that cool and would require a lot of power to do it. And then most people are not putting a solar system on their rig that can handle an air conditioner in the summer. Other benefits of having a big power system is in the winter when the sun's really low and it's cloudy. If you only have 200 watts, in that case, you're probably only making 60 or 70, which is barely enough to run your fridge. If you have a huge solar system, when it's cloudy and the sun is low in the winter, you're still making three, four or 500 watts, which is more than enough to run everything and keep your batteries topped up and run your lights and your refrigerator. It's creating peace of mind. It's spending the time and money now to create a system that's passive and you're really not gonna have to play with ever again, where you don't have to worry about your power consumption at all. You know you're gonna be comfortable in any climate. That's what I want you to take away from this video is put the money into the things that are gonna keep you comfortable. Insulation, solar, air conditioning. Okay, and let's wrap this whole thing up with finishing the build, the grind as I call it. Once you have your groundwork laid, your wires are in, your plumbing's in, you are insulated, your walls are up, you basically have this blank canvas of a shell on which to build your whole thing. And this is gonna take a lot of time and can be the most frustrating and most rewarding thing. But don't get discouraged because it's taking way longer than you think. People on Instagram make this look like it happens overnight. It does not, it, it's going to take days and days and days to do one little stupid thing. Resources, YouTube is great. Just any how do I blank on blank school bus will usually get you a video of somebody who's already run into the problem you've run into. If you buy a bus where the inside is put together with rivets, buy or borrow a pneumatic air chisel and a big air compressor and just People will say, oh, don't buy a bus with rivets inside. It's probably faster than taking screws out. There's a website called schoolie.com, which has a lot of resources on how to do things, but also a lot of prefabricated kits for things like the rear heater delete, window deletes, propane tank mounting brackets, mini split mounting brackets, roof raise kits. Join Facebook groups. The biggest single resource I had doing this and learning about this was meeting other people who have done it and asking what would you do differently? What do you think you did right? And then they'll open up to you about their build because doing this is, is a labor of love that's hard and takes a lot of time. People are really passionate about it. Use propane hot water heater and propane stove. Some people will do electric. You have this awesome electrical system, but here's the thing guys, you don't want it to be the dead of winter. It's been cloudy for four days. You're scratching long and all of a sudden you want to cook some pasta and you're trying to boil water and you run your battery out of power because you only have an electric stove. I have two propane propane tanks under the bus. They have lasted, I swear to God, a full year. I made it one year without filling the propane and filled them in the exact spot where I filled them last year at this little store. Of using my stove every day and my water heater every day. It's so much more efficient to heat water and cook with propane. If you do end up getting a full-size bus, you're not going to be able to go to AutoZone and just pick up parts for it. You're going to be looking in places like Fleet Pride and trucking stores to get your equipment. I found these stores intimidating at first to go in because they're like, what's your truck number? What's your company? And I go, well, it's just me and my school bus. I think identifying there at first, hey, I don't really know what I'm doing, but I need this part is pretty helpful. Stop by a trucker bling store and get some uh, hub covers and lug nut caps. It, it really completes the look on the outside, cleans up your thing, and you'll get a lot of brownie points with the truckers on the road. I am currently installing a CB radio. You're gonna be playing in trucker land, but you're gonna be smaller than most trucks. So being able to communicate and go, hey guys, I'm the school bus, I think is a pretty good idea. So let's wrap this thing up. If you're a little bit mechanically inclined, you don't wanna pay rent, 
you want the option of being able to move wherever you want and want to build something that's uniquely yours and that you're passionate about and know every stitch about. Doing the schoolie conversion is a really amazing process that is going to leave you with something that you're very, very proud of and get to use all the time and enables a ton of really, really cool experiences. It is hard. It is frustrating. It is time consuming, it is labor intensive, and allow yourself the space and time to let, let it take a while. Network as much as possible. Like Wes was saying, if you can weld, that's awesome. A lot of people can weld. If you can find people in your area who know how to weld, this is gonna be a huge resource for mounting everything and anything to the bus in a metal capacity. Meeting some local truckers, dump truck owners, those kind of people who know the ins and outs of the heavy truck industry are going to be super useful in getting you in the right direction for parts and service. What I found doing this is that the stoke around it was contagious, especially if you paint it first. People are like, that's a really cool looking thing. I want to help you with that. And a lot of people have a unique skill set that they're gonna be able to maybe help you with one little thing on down the road. We met a guy who did window tints and then I got my windows tinted. Being open about what you're doing to your community and networking is going to be really, really helpful. But maybe you have an electrician friend. Maybe you have a plumber friend. I think one of the coolest things about doing all of this is because it's completely your own expression, your own blood, sweat, and tears. That shows in the final product and you drive it around and it makes people happy. They go, wow, somebody put energy into that thing and it, it worked and they're doing it. That's the energy I get from everyone on the road. You see a camper on the road? All right, but I get thumbs up and waves and looks from everyone and I see smiles. By doing this, you contribute to your happiness, but whether you post about it or not, contribute to other people's happiness, just a little bit. And that's really cool. That was on my chest and I really wanted to get it out. If you made it to the end of this video, thank you so much. Fly safe, fly good, don't suck, I guess. This isn't even a pair about a video. Subscribe, leave a comment if you have any questions about buses that I haven't answered, put a comment in and I'll do my best to answer them. Thank you so much. Have a great week.